So over the last several lectures, we've looked at some examples of Newton's method in action. And we've seen that, yeah, Newton's method does appear to be working. All the examples we looked at, uh, the sequence generated by the, the method's formula converged to a number that did appear to be the solution to whatever equation it was we started with. Uh, so what, what I'd like to do in this uh, lecture is prove the correctness of Newton's method, prove that those weren't coincidences. This really does always converge to the solution to the equation that we started off with. And to do that, I'm going to use this theorem here. This theorem is one we've actually seen before, right? Back when we were talking about uh, iterative methods in general, we proved this theorem that said that if certain criteria certain criteria are met, the, the box criterion here and this bound on the derivative, then uh, the sequence that we generated converged uh, to the fixed point of the function that we were iterating. And in our case, that fixed point is going to be a solution to the equation that we started with. And we'll, we'll see that as we go along here. All right, so fundamentally, Newton's method is an iterative method. And you see, I've written it that way down here at the very bottom of the slide, right? We take a number, x sub n, we put it into the formula, we get x n plus 1 out. So if I can prove that these two criteria hold, the box criterion and the bound on the derivative, uh, then the theorem says that the sequence that we generate using Newton's formula converges to the solution to our equation. So this is the theorem that I actually want to prove here. We're going to start by assuming that f is a C2 function, that f, its derivative, and its second derivative are all continuous. And I'm going to say if p is a number on that interval such that f of p equals 0, in other words, if a solution to the equation exists and the derivative is not equal to 0 at that point, then there exists this delta greater than 0 such that Newton's method works. It generates a sequence that converges to p for any initial approximation on that interval p minus delta to p plus delta. Okay, so my first concern here is, is the, can, I, can I even be sure that this Newton's method formula is defined on some interval around p? Because that f prime of x in the denominator part is concerning. If, that's, if I can't guarantee that that is never equal to zero, then I can't be certain that this function exists. Right? And we do know that it's not equal to zero. Right? Because f prime is continuous, uh, there exists a delta 1. That's not my final delta. Right? But there exists another delta uh, such that the derivative is not equal to zero on that interval from p minus delta 1 up to p plus delta 1. That's just the definition of continuity. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, now that we know our function is defined, what is the derivative of this function? Right? How can we find the derivative? Well, I'm just going to use uh, basic derivative rules. The derivative of x is 1. Uh, and I found the derivative of the quotient there, just using the quotient rule. Right? And we can do, do some serious simplifying with this. Because if, if we split up the fraction, this is just f prime squared. So if we split the fraction, this part is going to be 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. And all that's going to be left is this part. And so that's our derivative. Now, first, uh, just to be clear, this, this g prime is continuous, right? Uh, because f itself is c2, f f prime and f double prime are all continuous functions so any anything that's um a, a product or, or quotient of those functions is also going to be continuous all right so hold on to that because we're going to need to know that g prime is continuous in just a minute so now i, I want to take this g prime function and i want to evaluate it at p all right so if i do that i get this expression and this is equal to zero because remember one of our initial assumptions up here was that f of p is equal to 0, which means this factor is equal to 0, so the whole thing must be equal to 0. And that's what I needed. All right, that's what I needed. Because g prime is continuous, right? you remember how you showed continuity 
way back in first semester calculus. It was essentially a limit question, right? You showed that the limit of the function was equal to the function value. And you did that by saying, well, for every epsilon neighborhood of the function value, there exists a delta neighborhood around the x value such that everything in that delta neighborhood got mapped into the epsilon neighborhood. Well, instead of epsilon, I'm going to say k. Right, so what this what what I have now is for any k between zero and one, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that if the absolute value of x minus p is less than delta, then the absolute value of g prime of x minus g prime of p is less than or equal to k. Really, in, in continuity, it, it's less than, but if it's less than, it's also less than or equal to. Now, we showed up here that g prime of p is equal to 0. This term goes away, and what we've shown is that if x is on this delta interval, then the derivative is less than or equal to k. And that's the bound condition from the theorem. OK, so that's half of it. Right? That's half of it. All that's left to be shown is the box criterion. We need to show that if x is on this interval, then g of x is also on this interval. In other words, g maps that interval into itself. Right now, to do that, we're going to use the mean value theorem. Right, the mean value theorem says that for every x on that interval, there exists a z somewhere between x and p such that this is true. The absolute value of g of x minus g of p is equal to g prime of that z, whatever it is, times the absolute value of x minus p. Now, walk through this right now there, there's a lot going on here right g of x minus p is equal to g of x minus g of p right p is the fixed point of the g function so p and g of p are the same now this next step this is just the, our conclusion from the mean value theorem and to get to the inequality i'm going to use that that bound that we found on the previous slide I'm going to replace g prime of z with the bigger value, k, and that's where this becomes less than or equal. Now, remember, k is strictly less than 1, which means if I replace k with 1, the result gets even bigger. And my assumption was that x is on this interval. Well, if x is on that interval, that's another way of saying the distance from x to p is less than delta. Okay, ignore all the stuff in the middle, all right? Ignore all the stuff in the middle and just focus on the ends. The absolute value of g of x minus p is less than delta. That's just another way of saying that g of x is on the interval from p minus delta up to p delta uh, p plus delta and that's what i need to show if x is on this interval then g of x is also on this interval that's the box criteria okay so since we've shown both criteria of the theorem the conclusion of the theorem must be true and the theorem says that this sequence that we generate must converge to p. And remember, our initial assumption was that f of p equals 0. In other words, p is a solution of the equation. So as a practical matter, finding a, a, a value of delta for a specific function uh, isn't something we're really going to be able to do. So this theorem is, is important from the theory of Newton's method, the theory of fixed point iterations. Uh, because it, it tells us that the sequence is going to converge for some values. 
as a practical matter, you're going to start off probably using some kind of graphical solution to get uh, some idea of, of where the root is. You're going to you're going to pick an initial approximation. You're just going to see what happens. Uh, it usually only, only takes a few passes uh, through the method to see whether or not your sequence is converging. Uh, if it is, great, you're home free. If it isn't, you, you go back and just pick something else, try to get a little closer. So in the next lecture, uh, we're going to wrap up our kind of theoretical conversation about Newton's method uh, by taking a look at its, convert, at its order of convergence. Uh, and we're going to get some good news to offset the bad news that we got when we were talking about iterative methods in general. We're going to see that in the case of Newton's method, uh, we will quite often get the kind of quadratic convergence that we really want to get from our iterative methods.